let's try to get started. So yeah, I'm Pedro. I'm an associate professor in computer science at the University of Chicago. I run the lab called Human Computer Integration Lab, and that's really what I'm gonna talk about today, is this notion or idea of, of what happens after wearable devices and how might computers start to integrate more intimately with our physical body. Um, before it gets too abstract and we start sort of debating what I mean exactly with a metaphor of integration, I just wanted to show you one quick example. This is an older work of mine called Muscle Plotter. And what you see here are two car designers doing what they do best, sketching and figuring out which of these two car shapes, the car body, is most aerodynamic. They're trying to figure out which one would flow best against the wind and provide less drag. Normally they would stop here and go to a wind simulator, you know, Autodesk 5000 wind simulator. But these folks are gonna continue to work on the pen and paper type of model, but actually do access a wind simulator. Notice that the person wrote wind tunnel 10 meters per second on the top, and all of a sudden they're actually getting these lines, which is the computed wind flow as the wind would actually traverse the cross section of this car, and you can see there's some turbulent wind in the back. Now the question is how are they doing the simulation? Because I don't see a computer, I don't see anything else. And so the simulation is there, there's a computer, it's in the background of this image, you don't see it. But the special part here is that the user doesn't know the output of a simulation. That's why we need these computer simulations, it's com complex fluid dynamics, is non-intuitive and all that. What's actually happening is that those electrodes on the right side are connected to the user's arms, and there's a little computer that has simulated the sketches, and they're sending tiny electrical impulses that cause the user's arm to move left or right involuntarily and to draw on the paper. So for a second, as crazy as that might sound, as Michael mentioned, for a second, you sort of cede your arm's control to the computer, it takes over, and there's a little bit of a turn-taking thing, and it outputs the wind flow simulation. And the person actually continues to work on this for about 10 minutes, and they really drill down and find that it's the tailwinds that are the problem. I invite you to watch it, this or any of the videos on YouTube if you're interested in, in the rest of that. So I hope you're asking the same question that I was when I started having these ideas, which is why should we do this, right? Like what's the point of a computer scientist sticking electrodes onto people's muscles and trying to control them for what purpose? And I think one of the things that I think is really interesting is to look at how far has computing become in the last 100 years or so, which is really you know, a much broader lens than, than most folks tend to take. And so this precedes me, but some of you in this room might still remember these times where universities like Stanford had one computer, and that one computer sat in one room and people fought to have time on that computer, and they would spend maybe an hour a day with that computer running their code and their simulations. So computers were bigger than the users. It's the, what I'm trying to represent here with these bubbles. And then there was a fantastic revolution, you know, uh, powered by many, many, many pioneers in HCI. Of course, Douglas Engelbart is one of the most famous in this territory, in which the computer starts to change and shift size and sort of equals the user, and now it's sitting eight hours in your office. And you can talk to a computer interactively very fast for eight hours a day. And we all know where this goes. This goes into the user's pockets. This is the most famous device of all times because apparently we have more mobile phones than we ever had any other kind of computer. Everybody has one of these, including me, in their pockets, right? And so now you're actually accessing computer anytime, anywhere as you walk around. What I'm trying to depict here is that notice every shift in interface affords us to do completely new things. It's really big and we know it doesn't stop here, right? If I shift this to today, we're with wearable devices. Sometimes in my intro to HCI class, I joke with my students the first years and say, well, you know, you take this, two Velcro straps, put it here. That doesn't seem like a great invention. You call it a smartwatch or a wearable. But it truly is a great invention because what you are now able to do with something touching your skin 24 seven is very different from just in your pocket, right? And so no wonder that all of you that have smartwatches use you know, the Fitbits and all that for physiological sensing. It touches your skin, senses heart rate, and so forth, so forth. It's at the skin level. It's very different from at the pocket level. Pocket level is great too, but affords different things. And so what I spend my, you know, waking time and sometimes dream time too is on this question. I hope you all spend some time there too, which is what comes after that? And now if you believe this bubble analogy where sort of the device becomes smaller first, and then sort of starts to approximate the user's body to the point that the wearable is sort of like that first initial contact just with the skin, then you might ask all kinds of questions, right? For example, what would happen if we designed for that overlap over there where the two circles sort of integ integrate? And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And I think the first example that I picked for you today with the muscle plotter is an extreme example of that integration because you know the system kind of intentionally borrows parts of the user's body, in this case, the muscles, 
to really perform this function. If you would ask you know, an exam-type question, please indicate all the hardware components of muscle plotter, at some point you had to say the muscles, because without the muscles there would be no plotting, there would be no output, right? And so that's the type of type connection that I'm going to explore here today with this idea of devices that integrate with the body. So I'm going to just kind of lead you a little bit historically with my work because it kind of tells a larger story of why I'm interested in these things. And so the first track of research I started doing along these lines of bodily integration with wearable devices is about the question of can we move into a future where virtual realities are more realistic? Um, notice that a lot of people in these images are wearing some kind of virtual reality headset in the sense that we are now sort of immersed in a world that, you know, you go to Target, you buy a VR headset for 300 bucks, and what you see in it visually is very, very impressive. Like, I never actually thought I would see that, and that came, you know, within 10 years of me saying, I don't, don't think we'll ever see photorealism. And now we're there. This is actually, we're showing two scenes here, you know, uh, this is maybe where you all are going today later, Tahoe, um, in, a, in a desert scene. And these are not even Pixar level VR. This is just made by my student Jazz sort of overnight as they were trying to set up an experiment in VR. So imagine what you know, real VR looks like. Now, while the visual realism is immense, this illusion breaks down really easily if I start to try to interact with this and expect physicality. If I go to that Lake Tahoe mountain and try to push through that wall over there, I know that there's no way that 300 buck headset that I bought at Target has any hardware whatsoever to provide that physical force feedback, that realism of touching a resistive force and just my hand sort of standing there at the wall of that jet. And so that's one of the things that I think today is sort of stopping VR from becoming a really, really immersive uh, sort of training simulation for learning physical skills. It's fantastic for gaming, but if you actually want to learn physical skills to transfer to the real world, we need that type of sensation. And so maybe some of you know that we've solved this problem before. I shouldn't be talking about this problem before. Sean certainly knows that we've solved it before in the field of robotics with things like this, right? This is an exoskeleton device. I really like this one. It's called UL7 uh, by Perry et al. And what you see here is a person in VR. They're just not wearing the goggles, but notice that they're you know, playing with this ball. The ball goes up and down the incline, and they feel the resistive force as all these motors sort of push against their joints. And they kind of like, wow, it's hard to push the ball up the incline for the force of gravity. It's a beautiful device. It's really easy to control. And it's very precise and all that. But unfortunately, this type of device is completely at odds with the VR that we're experiencing today, right? This is where VR is at. And I'm even showing VR headsets that you can't buy anymore. That's old, old quests, right? So you can buy the new ones. You can buy the, the Apple ones. You can buy whatever it is. But it's all untethered, mobile, free form tracking everything. Even the tracking is done inside out, right? There's absolutely no, not even more base stations, installations. Whereas this thing requires to be bolted to the wall to provide a resistive force, you know, Newton's third law, it's always a hard one, and also lots of batteries, because motors, power, so forth, so forth, so forth. So one of the first things that we thought when we started working on this idea of integration with the body is perhaps this allows us to make this device much smaller. Perhaps if we go directly to the body, we don't need huge batteries and motors and so forth. And so we wanted to do a still very realistic force feedback device but with all, without the constraints and trying to circumvent physics in a creative way, right? trying to really get the same output force even. And so what I'm going to show you here is how we got inspired by medicine and neuroscience and took this technique that exists since the 60s really called electrical muscle stimulation when we were to apply a tiny little electrical impulse over a pair of electrodes. In this case, if you would apply it over these two, your hand actually kind of moves upwards like that. All right, this is an involuntary reaction that works just because muscles are tiny electrical machines, and they always do that in the presence of an electrical current. And now you can put these things together and think, okay, doctors are fiddling with the knobs when they do these therapies using electrical muscle stimulation, but what if the electrical muscle stimulation is the interface for you to feel these forces in virtual reality? Putting that together, and this is work I did in my PhD with Patrick Bowdish at HPI, you're going to get experiences like this. So this is a person in VR, and when they touch these walls, their hand cannot penetrate through the wall because their muscles recoil just in time to provide this illusion of force that comes from their own body. This last room here, I'm actually kind of fast forwarding, cutting a scene here, but the last room was really a fun thing to do at Kai and at SIGGRAPH because we're really trying to emulate the thing you saw at the exoskeleton. This person is literally trying to pick up this cube 
the cube should have weight if we're doing it properly. And so what I do here is make their muscles go down. They have to fight the involuntary going down. And that interaction of forces feels like force feedback. There's something pulling me down and I'm pulling up. Feels like force feedback. So it creates this sense of realism, this heightened realism in VR. And again, the obvious advantages here is that, you know, the hardware is so much smaller, right? The weird thing about the talk that I'm giving today is I'm a hardware person, but my goal is to take out hardware things, right? Instead of adding more hardware to create these sensations, right? For example, pushing the hand with a motor to generate a wall, I'm actually searching for parts in the body that can already do that and ask myself the question, what is the minimum set of electronic components that I need to talk to that part of the body? And in this case, the muscle stimulation talks to the muscles, the muscles do the force. Well, that's so much smaller than going the motor route. I'm not gonna show you a lot of hardware, but I wanted to at least show you just one. So you see there's really nothing special about these types of devices. And so I just chose this old device that I made <clears throat> back in 16 for WIST. And it's just one of electrical muscle stimulation bracelets. There's all the normal things you would expect here. You know, there's a little Arduino microcontroller that talks to the VR application over wireless or Bluetooth in this case. And really the, the key part is this. This is the same thing doctors are using, right? The medical grade muscle stimulator, except in this case, we're just controlling digitally rather than with the knobs, and then there's batteries. Now, the fun part is this stuff here, you all know very well. This is all solid state electronics. This is all normal components. Moore's law operates here. So this is, you know, in 2016, I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm a computer scientist. I know, have no idea how to make hardware. I made this thing really big, but I kind of had this feeling of like, this part can go small. The electrodes, though, you need to have a certain size, and I'm happy to talk about limitations later, to address that muscle. The beautiful thing is that that part is soft, it's made of fabric, it's kind of like a tissue type thing, so you can put it in your clothes. There's lots of people trying to do that for rehabilitation purposes and interactive purposes, too. But what I'm trying to say is this is miniaturizable really easily, and in fact, my student Jazz Brooks did one that is so small that it goes inside the nose. I'm happy to show you later why we put electrical simulator inside of the nose, but it's literally the same circuit, the same device. It has battery, Bluetooth. It's literally the same one, but it, it can be really, really small if you're a better engineer than me, which is the case of Jazz and many other of my students. All right, now what I think is interesting, just as I told you that every time we had a revolution in HCI paradigm, right, we were able to do new applications that the previous paradigm made no sense for, I think there are new applications here that come from this new paradigm. All right, so I'm not gonna show a lot of them, but a lot of them are about haptic force feedback, so feeling forces in VR. But I wanna show this one from my student, Yudai, because I think he took it to a slightly different territory that is very, very interesting. Yudai and I um, had talked a lot about how people train to do things. I don't know if you have to do fire training safety here. I'm sure you do. We do that every year at UChicago. And it's those things that you watch a video for 10 minutes and then you click yes. I know how to act in the case of a fire, which is not exactly the same as knowing how to act in the case of a fire, because you don't have this sort of embodied immediate sense of what I should actually do when the stakes are high. And so what you're seeing here is an application that you and I made where people are training the fire safety in my actual lab. So they're learning what should you do if that happens, a fire, the fire is virtual in this case, augmented reality, and the person actually misses where the fire extinguisher is at. So Yudai's system detects that, they've dwelled too long on that, and uses the muscle stimulation on their neck to guide their point of view to the actual location so they can continue the training and get that muscle memory of like it's over there, it's under the desk, right? That feeling of it's to the left and down is what we're depicting here. The rest of the video is really cool. I invite you to see it. I actually teach you fire safety. If the fire breaks in the ceiling, always evacuate. There's no point in taking out a fire that is in the ceiling. And that system also tells you where the fire exit is at by like showing you with your head where you should go. It's really, really fun. Again, people in robotics have been doing this forever. We got inspired by them, really. Like the idea of head actuation is there before. But the type of hardware is very prohibitive for an application like training. I mean, this is a really a medical rehabilitation exoskeleton that you can only use in particular conditions. But having almost no hardware over here, just these soft electrodes, is a totally different type of scenario. So I wanted to emphasize that um, and kind of close the chapter on this force feedback and talk a little bit about more about the rest of the work that we've been doing. So kind of, I put you now historically at the point where I started my lab at the University of Chicago about four or five years ago, in which I really didn't know if what we had done with muscles was possible, this integration with the user's muscles was possible in other modalities. 
That was the question that I was really excited to figure out. And so we started to move to different sensory systems of the person's body and ask the question again, can I make a device with less hardware by talking to the biology that the body already has? So let me show you what we did for the case of temperature, and let's return actually to that Lake Tahoe experience, which I think is really fun, right? These two experiences here, being in a desert, being in a snowy mountain, are not gonna feel real if there's no temperature component. Right? When you think of desert, you think really, really hot. And so people in HCI, of course, have figured this out. This is, again, really important for training. Um, what they use is any kind of like mechanical device that can do that. For example, this is a heat lamp. Of course, it's like one kilowatt of power, so a really heavy device. Again, I'm not clear how the VR headset we have today, we already have problems with the battery of the new headsets, are going to last for generating a cooling or heating sensation. So the question, again, same story. How do we make this more power efficient by going to the body? Jazz's um, solution that we published a while back at Kai, Kai 2020, is to actually find another illusion in the human body. So what you see here is a person in VR, and they are wearing a device on their nose. Temperature of the room, completely controlled at 20 degrees Celsius, so nothing is changing, yet they're warming their hands in this furnace and they think something is changing. What's actually happening is we're pulverizing a tiny, tiny bit of smell in their nose. And now you're wondering, wow, smell doesn't feel like temperature. That has nothing to do, these two sensory systems have nothing to do with one another. But let me just zoom in the nose for a second and talk about these weird receptors that we have in our nose and by the way, all over our skin. You know, if you heat them up, we must be feeling temperature somehow. So there's a little temperature sensor in our skin receptors that fires, of course, to indicate what our temperature we're feeling. But then what about chemicals? So what about when you go to the Indian restaurant and have spicy food? Don't you feel hot? So what's happening there? Turns out these receptors at a cellular level have also a chemical mechanism that fires. The only reason why when you're having spicy food and you know it's the spicy food and not temperature is because the contextual cues are very obvious. You're like, we're eating. That particular cell has no idea if we're eating or not. Happy to talk about the thoughts that biologists have of why that receptor is there for chemical, but it's probably a signaling mechanism. And so we're doing that. As crazy as it might sound, what this device is actually projecting is a minuscule amount. I want to emphasize that 0.1 microliters of capsaicin in a droplet form factor, the person inhales that, and that's enough to make them feel like it's hot. And then we flip to another component here, which is eucalyptal. If you ever had um, like a breath mint, right? You feel very refreshed with a breath mint. Eucalyptal or menthol do the same thing, but on the opposite side of the channel. So what they do is sort of create a cooling sensation as the other is another receptor that you have inside of your trigeminal nerve that does that. And the person is walking outside in the snow, it feels sort of like this Arctic blast of Chicago um, as they walk outside. Certainly not the Stanford emulation here. Um, what's really interesting, and this is, it's all kind of limitations here, but it is an illusion, so it's much weaker than real temperature, but, I mean, the power consumption is ridiculous. We just need to activate this little ultrasonic emitter and get a droplet flowing in the air. James. Do you feel it more in your head than the rest of your body? This is such a good question. So that's what we thought. And I would say many of participants just felt this localized thing. It should actually feel localized because, as you pointed out, it goes to the trigeminal nerve, innervates the face, end of story. That being said, some people reported to feel it on the whole body. I remember Jazz once running to my office and saying, great result. Participant took out their scarf and they're doing this and whatnot. You know, N equals that one participant doesn't mean a lot. But it should be localized, which is one of the downsides of this, so not true room temperature type things. I think in conjunction with the visuals in VR, starts to make this feeling of spreading, but it's an illusory feeling. It's an awesome question. And again, what I'm emphasizing here is the same trick, right? My trick is just to not put the heater there, just to say, is there a heater in the body that I can leverage? And it turns out there is one, and it's really low powered, so very exciting. In fact, Jasmine uh, and Jazz took this further in a paper called Chemical Haptics, where because we have all our skin cells have these receptors, you can do all kinds of things, um, again, in for the sake of virtual reality here, on the skin cells. So you can do cooling um, here in the cheeks. This is actually a fantastic experience. If you ever like go to my lab, please ask Jasmine for that cooling one. It feels already cold when your cheeks are receiving mental over here. Do you try other locations like the gears since people are wearing stuff and most of us don't? 
We just had a discussion the other day about years because also you use that to thermoregulate, so it could actually help people that have problems thermoregulating. We have not tried it, so I would love to, actually. It's really, really fantastic. Um, we can do other things. This is actually a training application as well. So, right, another type of training we have to do because we work with chemicals is what do you do if you spill a chemical on your desk or something? And by the way, it's wash your hands, wash your eyes in that order. Never flip that order. But there's no sense of training and heightened impact when you're watching a video on YouTube about this and just click yes. Here it actually simulates, so there's a chemical passing through your skin and these open channels of silicone. The channels are open, your skin absorbs the chemical very slowly, feels like stinging, like tickling. It's a safe type of stinging. It's really interesting, right? We can create this heightened realism like you're actually in that chemical spill moment, but it's all a safe simulation. We can do lots of weird things. We can actually use lidocaine, the same thing your dentist uses. This is a topical lidocaine, so it's very, very weak numbing. And remove sensations, um, I have no idea what to do with that. So if you have ideas, I'm always searching for that. I call it negative haptics, but I've never said that out loud too much. Again, same idea. All my colleagues in haptics, and, and, and many of you know this well, have been trying to make better and better actuators to address all these senses individually. What's interesting here is that the skin has these sensors. Many of them are chemically triggered, so you can kind of find a new pathway to generate sensations with one single device. Now, at this point, I want to emphasize that we're kind of, I'm tricking you a little bit because I talked about integration with computers. I talked about desktops, wearables. All those systems have input and output. And then I'm just showing you a haptics talk where I only talk about output and it feels a little misleading. So I think the next step in my research was sort of to close this loop and imagine the same question, integrated devices with a body, but now this time they can do input and output. What would it mean to compute like a variable or feel a variable through my body alone? You know, not sense of vision and so forth. And so I could show you all kinds of older work, but I actually want to sort of sidestep a little bit to the more recent things where we're really looking at how can we assist folks with acquisition of skills? So you want to learn how to play piano. The only way people address that with computers right now is sort of like watching a YouTube video and trying to follow along. And that's fair. I, I get a lot of YouTube videos learning how to play piano, but I can't understand how much force I should put in a movement. I can't even train my muscles to actually do that instead of I'm just stuck in this loop of translating what I see to how I should move. And so this is work by my uh, now postdoc Kaki, this was actually when he was an intern, where we found a way to do the muscle stimulation approach on the back of the hand to get these sort of more precise movements. So this is not Aki playing, but just the computer playing for him. This is the James Bond song, if you haven't realized it. And of course, you know, we're now in the process of trying to find out how much this is actually teach you, you know, and compared to a piano teacher and compared to like just watching a score and compared to games where you play piano and VR and all kinds of things. But it sounds like from very early results, the question of, for example, force, how much pressure should I put, this does it really, really well. The question of how fast it seems very dependent on people, whether they want the sort of physical mode of training or not, but you know, the results aren't out yet. Now, I want to emphasize, and this applies to all the muscle stimulation stuff, this is really, really difficult to do with a lot of precision. I'm sure if you play piano, you were like, Pedro, that is not a very elegant piano playing technique. <laughs> Fingers are going slightly sideways. It actually only moves one joint. It kind of flexes all the way. It doesn't really stop at the point you're like, mm-hmm, this is not good. <laughs> yes, absolutely with you. And in fact, if you drill into the results of the muscle plotter one, the first one I've shown you with the cars and the wind tunnel, the system is fairly precise. Sometimes I used to give this talk and say, oh, it has four millimeters of error. And people were really excited about four millimeters. And now I just say, think of, for example, Michael is taking notes. Each letter is smaller than four millimeters. So this thing can't even you know, do one single letter, much less you know, a letter properly. But especially, although it can follow the trajectory very well, notice how much it jitters it cannot stop very well. It can go really well and can reach a target, but it has no idea how to stop and at that target and stay there. It's a very difficult control problem, and a lot of actually biomechanical people look at this problem, and, and some, some of them like muscle plotter and, and tell me this is useful, but also re recognize nobody really knows how to solve this problem. We've been trying to solve the control problem, how to stop the muscle stimulation, by now sort of taking a full loop and being inspired by the exoskeleton approach. This is actually work that Yuji helped do in my lab when she just joined and, and was spearheaded by Romain with the help of Shen Yuan. And so here we're trying to take the muscle stimulation to the next level. 
not only we're able to do individual fingers, but stop at very precise angles, the kind of thing you would need if you wanted to automatically learn how to do a guitar chord. So in this case, the left hand of Romain is controlled by the muscle stimulation plus a small mechanical device that assists with stopping in the right place. So he didn't create that chord, he's just strumming along, and that chord was created by the muscle stimulation. And the reason why this is more precise, and you can see it here better in the demo where Yuji is actually speaking sign language, is we're using muscle stimulation, but we're also using a, an additional mechanical device here. These mechanical brakes that are very small and worn on the fingers. So in this demo, actually, um, Yuji and Romain are talking. Romain has no idea about American Sign Language, and he's using a little translator application to film Yuji and understand what she asked. She asked, what's your major? He's going to respond just textually, HCI, Human Computer Interaction. And what's happening is that that data gets sent to the glove, and the glove now decides which fingers are free to move and which fingers should be locked in place. And so now it doesn't matter how precise your muscle stimulation is, because if there's a movement that would accidentally be created, it's locked and it can't happen, right? So we selectively choose which fingers are free, which fingers are locked, and the resulting movements, if you speak sign language, will look not great again, but the best we would ever be able to do. So here you can see the mechanical brakes. This one is locking and locking, just so you can see the ratchet palm mechanism just for a second. And now you can actually see an age in sign language. A pretty good C, I would say, and the I is kind of all over the place a little bit. But this is a completely different level of realism for in precision for finger poses that we've never able to do before. So again, the question here that I'm really interested in right now is, does it help to learn these things, to feel the muscle memory? And by the way, I must say, this is an incredibly small subset. If you speak American Sign Language, there's the whole face, there's the whole body, there's the distance between these two things. We can't do any of that. But we're finger spelling some very simple selected characters, I must say. The age of the CNI is what we can do. <laughs> so I want to emphasize that. Now, notice what I think happens in this track of research. We start here with very simple movements, and we start going here and saying, wow, you maybe are struggling to learn guitar and we can help, and you're struggling to learn sign language, it can help, and you're not great at drawing these things and we can maybe help a little bit. And you have to ask the question of where do we stop extending the ability and actually endow people with sort of a new ability that their bodies might not be able to do. And so that's what we've been doing actually since a, a few years back. And here's an extreme example of that that my postdoc and I worked on four or five years on, which is accelerating someone's reaction time. I don't know if your doctors ever performed this test on you. This is a, you know, a cognitive aging test called the pen drop test. They drop a pen and see if you can catch it quickly. This is actually very hard, so they calibrate it by sort of you know, putting the pen more up so you can actually do it. Now, it's super naive. After you saw my talk, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the electrodes. There's a camera, tracks the pen. Done, you know, accelerator reaction time as fast as humanly possible. In fact, it's so ridiculously fast that, that June and I got a Guinness Book <laughs> award, <laughs> award for that, which is a very strange thing. And I can talk about that process. They come to the lab and then they say, please leave, we're going to measure things. And then, you know, you come back and I say, you got it. But here's the HCI question you all should be critiquing me for. Wait a second. Let's play the rest of that video. How does that feel like to the participant? <laughs> that seems almost stupid to do, right? How does that feel like? And here's how it feels like. And this is the story, actually, how I met June. This is his work, by the way. He did this. He took it a SIGGRAPH. That's where we met. And people in his demo were like, this sounds very cool, but I didn't do it. This is superhumanly fast. I, like, I didn't even initiate the movement, like mentally sending down this downstream command to say, let's move. It was already happening. He had the whole thing cranked up to the maximum. As soon as the camera saw a pixel drop, he would fire immediately away. In fact, he had even another one where there was muscle sensing on the dropper person. So as soon as that person started dropping, you were already catching the pen. You actually had to calibrate to not catch too fast. All right, so when I saw this, a new question comes to my head, and that's how John and I started working together, which is, wait a second. This integration is all super fun, and maybe you're as crazy as me and you believe this is the correct trajectory, but I think there's a really, really, really interesting singularity here. When you cross from the wearable to the integration, it's not clear what happens to the user's sense of agency, right? If I can now move your body 
initiate movements for you, that's very, very different. What's interesting is that a lot of AI folks are also thinking about this question, because the agency is somewhat shared once you have systems with initiative too. Not just muscle stimulation, but I want to emphasize that muscle stimulation cranks it up to a tremendous degree. And so what happened to our lab is that this is the thing we work on the most now, is like the sense of agency question, and it's kind of a third line of work. And I just want to point out, oh, I don't know why that did it twice, but I just want to point out what we actually did to understand if you can we speed up your reaction time? Can we give you that benefit, right? Maybe you're avoiding danger, not touching a power line that is high voltage or whatever it is. But we want to do that while you still have some sense of agency. Or we're training the drumming, we're moving the piano. You want to move, the system wants to move, intentions are aligned, but you want to feel like you're doing something, right? Because that actually impacts motivation. So what we did here is really, really interesting. We sort of asked the question of what's happening to people's sense of agency. So I had this crazy hypothesis when I met June that, you know, and I was wrong, I must say. If you do it by yourself, right, so y-axis, sense of agency, x-axis, reaction time. If you do it very slowly but completely by yourself, maximum sense of agency, you know, you're, no, you're doing it. Now, let's say I plot here your fastest reaction time. I do it 100 times. I know exactly how fast Michael is, for example. It's here. And you were to say, well, if I assist Michael to go faster, he's immediately going to report, I didn't do it. And then I asked my collaborators, June and Shinichi, like, what if we do it a little later and a little later and a little later and a little later and a little later? Is it completely binary, the sense of agency? And I actually thought it was. I thought it was like this. The moment you sense something coming in downstream, upstream, right, that is a little faster than you, you should be able to tell nothing. This is not me. Turns out that's not the case. That's what we found out in this Chi-19 paper um, by this experiment that obviously is not as exciting as a pen drop, but is more control that you can actually do these measurements very precisely. And then the sense of agency that you see falls still very sharply. So, you know, you could argue that's close to that step curve. But what happens is there are a number of really interesting points on this curve. So I just want to walk you through some of them. First and foremost, you can speed up your reaction time by a tiny fraction and you won't even notice. This is crazy. So there were people on their knees swearing to June during the trials. Like, I did it. I did it. And June is like, uh-huh. And he's looking at the log. And it says muscle stimulation condition. He's like, yeah, of course, of course. He did it. So that's, that's really remarkable. This has to do with the brain's flexibility to interpret timing. Of course, every circuit in your brain doesn't have a clock like a computer does. So it needs to have a little bit of leeway and flexibility. There's lots of works in psychology and neuroscience backing that up, too. But, oh, sorry. But I want to emphasize that 50-50 trade-off. And I came up with that semi out of the blue in that paper, and I didn't know if I was right here. But what I said is, what if I want to get motivated by doing the task? Maybe I want to pick having some speed up, but still feeling like half agency. And a lot of reviewers and people are like, half agency doesn't exist. And I said, but maybe it motivates people a little bit. You know, the speed up is not as tremendous as I could have with the system. But I want to have a little bit of feeling that I'm doing it, sort of like ownership and volition. And I'll show you that is important later. Um, so here's the pen drop with someone that's actually thinking that they did it. We're delaying the simulation by 80 milliseconds. This has to be tuned per participant. For this person, 80 milliseconds is sort of like a really nice number for them to fully believe it. And actually later, um, with Shinichi again, we found something crazy remarkable, which is actually we can take, so we train different groups of people one of them trained with very fast muscle stimulation how to perform a reaction time test, and another one with this delayed muscle stimulation. Only the group that was delayed, when we took out the electrodes later, they come back the next day and they perform the reaction time test again, they actually had a speed up. Placebo group, no, no clear speed up all over the place. Training by yourself, no, no placebo, but training by yourself, no speed up. Super fast muscle stimulation, the thing June was doing, right, with the, it goes as fast as the camera sees, no speed up. So the motivation, and we asked participants, like, why do you think this helps you? And they're like, well, I wasn't even sure. I think it was me, so I was motivated to keep trying and keep being better. So I'm really excited to design these kinds of systems. I'm not really trying to say that we should have systems that we're dependent on to learn how to play piano. We should just learn how to play piano with the help of these systems rip them all out, and now I can perform this task. And I want to emphasize that 8 milliseconds is really small, but if you play sports or racket things or whatever, 8 milliseconds is the difference between you caught the ball and you didn't catch the ball. So in reaction time, 8 milliseconds is a very substantial piece of the puzzle. All right. Now, um, I want to 
come back to this line of work just to emphasize, I'm really getting interested in sort of like how the insights, and I'll, I'll get back to you in a second. Oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I had a question about that previous one. Yes. Um, was there a condition where um, there was no muscle simulation, but the target was being released from like further up, so they actually were still? None of the studies were on the pen drop. They were sort of on just a visual reaction time with an LED. Yeah, but there was a condition, we call it sham, so it's kind of like more than placebo, where we told them there's muscle stimulation, we created the fake muscle stimulation, but there was no movement of the muscle stimulation. That doesn't work either. That being said, the interesting part is that sham removes a little bit of agency, so people were like, oh, there's something going on, I'm not completely in control. Oh, there they were. So that's, it. that's an interesting one. As I was saying, I'm really excited about this, I'm, and, and, and I was surprised as well that you all folks are really excited too, because I saw this beautiful poster yesterday in, your, in the Gates lobby, right, that says that, you know, the, the human-centered artificial intelligence center, the right one, I, I love the left one too, but the right one is exactly what I'm at, right? So how can not only HCI, you know, inform neuroscience and psychology, but how can we in HCI also be informed by those fields? And the advancements in those fields are tremendous for us to unlock better devices, more design, you know, more agency, and so forth, so forth. So I'm, I'm a really big proponent of that part, too. And so I want to emphasize that this optimization of the sense of agency is only during the movement. Notice that the person's intention is already aligned with the machine. We tell them, your job is to catch the pen or to hit the target, right? If the intention wasn't aligned, that's this paper. Things get more complicated, of course. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but it sort of like drops more dramatically the agency if it does the thing you don't want it to do. Now, the other part that we're working on is also we want to ensure control not just during movement, but also before or after. I want to be able to close these muscle stimulation systems immediately, much faster. It's more, much more problematic than how to close PowerPoint, right? It's like I don't want it to override any of my volitional things. And so we've been coming up with all kinds of, in different papers, at the beginning of different tasks, we come up with different methods. So over here you see a person, she always has control with her non-actuated limb to turn on, turn off the system. By the way, it's a paper that's coming out where people make caramel while they write an essay, and the muscle stimulation helps them make the caramel. I'll talk about that later if you want. And this one, uh, Affordance Plus Plus, an older work of mine where people op learn how to operate tools. This person picks up a spray can, and the spray can automatically starts shaking to tell you you should shake a spray can before you use it. And in this case, if you move fast outside of the location where the muscle stimulation starts to come in play, it automatically dismisses that. So it's kind of a positional control. We've um, played around with ideas of tool control, so I didn't mention, but in the muscle plotter one, the moment you lift the pen, there's a mechanical sensor in the pen. You lift the pen, cuts the muscle stimulation off. So you're in control of that part too. And in an older work of mine, which again I didn't show, uh, there's gestural control. So this person's heart, arm, arm is being muscle controlled. Any movement they do outside of the area of the muscle control, for example, catching a flying pen, in this case, immediately dis turns off the muscle stimulation. So there's more work to be done here, but I just want to emphasize that this is an active area that where us and, and a, few, a, few, a few others too are really interested in trying to understand how to provide more agency to the systems, but also more control. Now, another version of this is you can also go all full crazy and try to talk to the general public about these things. And so we made some, some artwork to explore the ethical implications of these extreme forms of control. This is a, a sculpture that I made with Alexandra Ion years back and with Patrick Bowders too, where two people sort of put their arms in there in this sculpture. There's nothing else you can do really but put your arms in there. And what it does is actually traps you and does muscle stimulation to your arm and you sort of like feeding this power, this electrical generator power to the machine. And this machine actually lives on in the museum space. This was actually in San Francisco for a while, by the way. Uh, and it was in Ars Electronic for a very long time as well. And, you know, like the machine is just replenishing its batteries by sort of sucking people's power. It's a, a very fun metaphor, and kids and families love to do this thing. Um, it's really interesting to have a discussion with the, with the wider public. It's totally different from the kind of thing we can do here as academics. Now, the thing that I got really interested with this notion of integration is that perhaps we can do another thing with this hat on of post wearables and integrating with the body, which is solve some problems that I think have been plaguing us for a little bit. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I kind of proposed a solution. I didn't solve it, but I proposed a solution to the force haptics problem, right? So we want to have forces in VR, but the VR headsets are very untethered, very relaxed and whatnot. And with muscle stimulation, perhaps 
there's a path to the future by you know, not having to rely on motors and batteries and doing the smaller version of the device. Now, there is another really, really big problem, and it's great that the Apple device just came out because now we can talk about this problem with even more importance, which is that we'll also want to feel tactile sensations when we touch virtual objects. That person over there, she's fixing a real engine, she's in the HoloLens, and if she touches that button to hang up the call or touch an interface, she should feel tactile feedback because that actually helps us be more precise and you know, like dexterous on the virtual interactions. The problem is that this is sort of where industry is selling us. It's these tactile gloves that completely cover your finger pads. And so now you're having, actually having to choose between virtual world or shaking someone's hand or actually fixing the engine, which is the task at hand in this case. So one thing we've had been exploring is this kind of almost paradoxical type of haptics where we want to do deliver sensations to the finger pad or to any target area. We want to keep that area free which is strange because normally you need to put the device in the area you want to stimulate, like the finger pad. So what you see here is actually a paper we published uh, last year at Kai by my student Yudai Tanaka. And you can see here someone climbing in VR, climbing a rope, and they can feel the texture of the rope. They can have full dexterity to grasp and doesn't slip, but they can also feel that virtual peg hold as they sort of start bouldering and grabbing that wall. And the way that that, that, that happens is the muscle stimulation, which in this case is called electrical tactile stimulation, is in the back of the hand, but in strategic locations that intercepts the nerves that are going from your brain to the front, right? You have millions of fingertip receptors over here. They all go through somewhere, and turns out they pass pretty close to the backside of the hand, so we put it here, but the sensation happens in the front, which is really nice. You can have the hands free. And I'm emphasizing how important this is because these are the haptic gloves that they're going to try to sell you next year. One of them is Meta. It's really beautiful. I've seen it a few times. Um, these ones are actually all commercial right now. This, this middle part, you can buy them all in stock, that one, so you can buy it today. And none of this, I think, is where we should be going. I think the idea that you can't shake someone's hand, you can't type on your keyboard, and you have to choose between being virtual or being physical is, is a really, really dangerous slope for the field of you know, technical HCI, VR, and so forth. And so this has been an important line of research, and Chen Yuan is really the person who started it all with this paper in our lab in Kai 21, which can we do this bizarre idea of haptics with finger pads free? So all those devices leave the finger pads and sometimes even the feet sort of free to feel real sensations, to walk in the real world and not fall and so forth, so forth. All right, so we're getting very close to the, to the end. I just want to give you some takeaway messages um, about this idea of integration. The first one, I think, is a really interesting way to think about a post-wearable world. And from the technical perspective, it does give us some new technical ways to think about it. We, if you talk to battery people, they're very stuck right now. And I think it's interesting to think maybe this is an improvement in power, because the type of power efficiency we have to optimize for is totally different now. It's also an improvement in size. So all these devices that I'm showing here, um, including some that I didn't focus too much on, are really so much smaller than their mechanical counterparts. Now, the second part is really this idea of endowing people with new abilities. It's something really interesting, and I'm talking of physical abilities here. I think computers do wonders already, cognitively enhancing us with other abilities. Um, I didn't show you this one, but this is a task we actually ask people to do as well, which is to take a photo with a normal camera of a flying baseball <laughs> shooting out of that cannon. Of course, none of our participants could do it. We brought it to SIGGRAPH. It was like one person that said, by accident, I was able to get the photo. Right? The idea is to get the ball right there in the middle of the screen. Um, of course, we can cheat this whole thing with the muscle stimulation. Yes, we can instrument the thing, tossing machine connected to this finger that controls the shutter, and now we can take the photo. But remember, we want to do, make people feel like they're doing it. So we're going to delay the muscle stimulation, again, in this case, by 80 milliseconds. And the person not only takes the photo, but they actually feel like they did it, or partially they did it, and they get motivated to learn this skill better. So right in the center of the photo. Um, and remember, I think it's really interesting that if you take it out, this was training. This was physical training that remained in some kind of muscle memory that you have. Now, where I think this is really interesting, it moves us from computers being super powerful tools for symbolic manipulation and reasoning, right, words in our head, to also being ways to access tacit knowledge, the ways we do things with our fingers and body and space. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, this paper is coming out in a, in a few weeks where we showed that, for example, we can help people do physical tasks where they're already good at the tasks individually, 
but they're really struggling to make them in parallel. So this is Aki, and he's not a musician, I must warn you, trying to play a rhythm that he constructed with a piano melody he constructed. He cannot do both at the same time, but he can choose which one he focuses on. One is done by muscle stimulation. He's playing the drum pad by himself. And the other one, uh, or sorry, muscle stimulation is playing the drum pad. He's playing the piano. And he's switching now. And so piano, muscle stimulation, it actually was looking at what he was doing. It starts looping. And he's focusing on the drums. Um, my postdoc, former postdoc, June, and I actually worked on this question a lot. And we started to ask the question of, like, can we even take it beyond muscle stimulation, right? So, for example, this is a small exoskeleton that we made that you wear like a glove. It's completely passive, just 3D printed. It allows you, as a designer, to access the experience of others. Like, what would it mean to have the size of a five-year-old's hand and make a bowl ready for them to eat? It's very difficult for a designer to actually access that. June made a study with designers. They were designing toys for kids. And just freeform, let them use the exoskeleton glove or any kind of tools they normally use, you know, spreadsheets with average ages and sizes and radius of hands. And they reported to feel like that embodied design experience was really, really important for them. Um, that's kind of what you see over there when they're testing out the different grips. And they solve different problems to this. I'm not saying this is better. I'm saying this is different. They solve different problems. Um, we also expanded that glove to sort of the practice and learning of piano, and we've done this study with teachers, so you connect physically to the hand of your teacher. Again, this is not an electrical device. This is just like a puppeteering little 3D printed thing. And it's really, really fun to also hear from the piano teachers what they use this for and like how does this impact their teaching experience. So that was a really fun study to do. And more recently, with the help of Tara, who works on protectile language, the language of deafblind individuals, we're actually using this as well together with them to kind of see if we can learn their language, can we speed up the way we learn their language, understand the micro cues they use when they move their hands. So this is June actually learning how to move his hands through a protectile individual who's showing him how he moves his hands. Now, I know I focused a lot, and this is pretty much my last slide, focused a lot on um, nerve stimulation, but I think this idea of integration goes beyond. I uh, just want to emphasize one work uh, by Jasmine, my student, who is integrating living organisms. This is a little living organism that lives inside of your smartwatch, and you have to take care of it every day, because if you don't, your smartwatch physically dies. And this idea is really interesting, because it makes people like consider the interactions and the relationship they have with the device. Like Participants in this study who live with this watch for a month were really scared of letting it die, trashing it, and started to think of the environmental impact of electronics and all that. So it's a really interesting if you want sort of umbrella or um, analogy, you can use this idea of integration on your own work too. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Now, I just want to, final slide, thank the sponsors. Thank really these people here. This is you know who made it all possible. I'm just sort of rolling the message in their behalf. And of course, many of the folks who are not in our lab anymore, but are wonderful people, and some of them are here, like you, Gia. Um, thank you so much. And if you have questions, I'm happy to. If you have a question, your arm will just raise. Uh, <laughs> you wanted this one? Um, considering, I mean, assuming there's some role of active recall in learning, so like to play the piano example, is there a way to just wait for the participant to initiate the movement yeah. and then kind of have it assist? Yes, that's what Sia, Sia is up to, this person. Sia is doing that right now because I agree with you. And I've talked to Jakob, a neuroscientist friend of mine, who, who did some work on fMRI and muscle stimulation. And he agrees with the two of us, too, which is if we just make people move, then they don't have this active recall phase where you sort of think about doing and try. Maybe you fail and you learn from the error. And so what Sia is doing is that the muscle stimulation sort of waits for you and either corrects you or helps you or just pushes you in the right direction or nudges you. I don't have results yet, but I would say that seems to be more effective. Right? She has some initial plots, and what it seems to be is that people are better at chunking, you know, when you learn by using little different chunks of the music piece or whatever it is. With the active part, you're better at chunking, and that's great for learning because it speeds up learning tremendously. So that's a great question. We're thinking the same direction, too. I think you were next. Do you want to? Yeah. There you go. Hey, um, whether you think technology like integration has been 
for people to, to, to change their relationship with their body in a mm-hmm. lot of ways, like you think people's relationship with their body might change their so own. Yeah. I, th- there I can only speculate. Um, I've always tried to convince some of my students to do work on dancing and also like, you know, heavy manual tools or expressive arts like, you know, glitch art and things like that, pottery and carpentry. My, my feeling is that it would allow you to explore different movements and different parts of your body that you're normally not using so much. So in, in, a, in a pilot that we did for these drumming things, we invited a professional drummer who did not like the muscle stimulation because they were like, I can already do all these things. I don't know why you're showing me that it can drum very reliably. I, I can drum very reliably. But then they were super interested in making the movements random, and they said to us, you know, oh, I never thought of moving in that way or hitting the symbol in this sort of power, inefficient way, because, you know, you learn in a certain, you start to sort of hone in your physical skills. So for them, it was a discovery process of what is the design space of their own movements, but this is, again, an anecdotal one person that came to the lab and tried this thing out, and it didn't work for that project, but it worked for this idea of, yeah, perhaps you could access your body in a new way, but it's all a speculation because we haven't done that yet. But I love that idea very much. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, how important is the placement location of these <laughs> electrodes, you know, and, and is there a way to sort of make it more seamless? Yeah, uh, it's huge. <laughs> it's huge. Um, did I have a slide about that? I used to have a slide about that because that, that happens. That happens. Um, is it here? It is. So, yeah, there's a number of limitations, and you see number three as electrode placement. So electrode placement is a really big problem with, with muscle stimulation. It's one millimeter can change, but not only that, really like rotation of your body, the skin and the inner muscles don't rotate in the same way. You can all try that by like, you know, touch your skin and just see how your body rotates in a different way inside, right? So that's by, by design from the body. And so we tried to, to work on all these in parallel. Um, the calibration stuff, is, we're not even there yet, but we just recently started working a little bit on, on the placement. One way you could try to circumvent the placement that I've seen some people in HCI doing is imagining that you not only have electrodes that you have to manually place, but you have a sleeve with 100,000 electrodes, all very small, and could you let the system figure out which ones are necessary? Right, the system sort of randomly tries to sample them all and observes the resulting movements and then says, oh, it's this, this. It's kind of like what we do when we manually place it. One irony of all this is that we don't know why I've tried to have those systems do it for you and see if they're faster than a human at calibrating. And it seems like me and all my grad students, including when she was there doing some muscle stimulation, we're all better than that system. So there's some equation that we have here that uh, maybe tacit knowledge based that we know how to calibrate the system better. Um, another way to avoid the electrode placement, but you're going to be scared by it, um, is um, to directly go to the brain. And so Yudai and I have been working on that. So what you see here actually is um, a person receiving haptic feedback by means of muscle stimulation, except the stimulation is happening in their brain. So those movements are involuntary. And I'll just skip to the, to the interesting part. That device that they are wearing on their head over there is a transcranial stimulation coil, so it's a magnetic stimulator that is on their heads, and that generates a sensation on the end point that you want it to be. But you sort of have to hit the right part of the motor cortex. It's another type of calibration, but there are no electrodes, right? So we're just thinking if this is also a viable approach to do this without electrodes. That being said, this is very big and scary. So, you know, have to think about other parts with, with this tool, yeah. There is a question back there, and there was one here, but I don't know which one is you were first. Maybe you were first. Yeah? OK. Then, then let's start with you. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if the muscle simulations were just as effective in the uh, populations. I feel like it was a great application yeah. for assistive technology yeah. for people. Yeah. And, and I, I want to make sure I, I, the message goes across that there's, you know, this is a small sliver of HCI. This is a really big sliver of medical rehabilitation field. So a lot of people use muscle stimulation. Uh, in my very first Kai paper I ever submitted in my life, the reviews were positive, but they say it only gets accepted. There was no revised and resubmitted at the time. It only gets accepted if you do a study that includes all their, all their people. And I, so I did that immediately. And yeah, it's, it's, it's almost the same thing. It has much more to do with how your muscles are in terms of their health and their strength than anything else. So it, it can build some muscle force, and that's great for an uh, older adult population because they start to have less muscle sort of you know, strength and, and power. But it works perfectly fine for anyone, yeah. 
including for folks with even more complicated situations like spinal cord injury and et cetera. If your muscles are degenerative, degenerated by some other condition, it still works perfectly fine, which is really, really promising in the field of rehab. Yeah, that's beautiful work going out there. And then it was you. Really fascinating that even if like the electrically simulated muscles make you play the piano, you feel the agency. You mm -hmm. would feel mm -hmm. that you still play and play. And there's, I think, there's also that beauty of when you're actually tangibly touching texture and that memories and that experience is more long-lasting than yeah. it's not, you know, just air touched. Yeah. And is there a way that we could closely work with to? improve and promote that you can still capture the the mental memory and the experience of when you're touching with your skin. Yeah, yeah, that's a really, really good question. I think that's exactly where we want to go. And and you know when I emphasize the idea that ideally we remove these devices at some point is because I think that's what we want to promote. We want to promote you to do the real physical experience. When we learn, we don't just learn the amount of force, we learn everything. The position of the piano keys and et cetera, et cetera. We've actually tried uh, playing piano in VR and it's just so terrible. I mean, it's fun for five minutes, but if you then compare it and sit at a real piano, it has nothing to do with it. And so I think you're right. I think we want to use this. We want to use the idea of promoting finger pad free to push people into doing physical skills that are joyful and really, really, really tangible, uh, more than virtual type of things, yeah. I think my take on virtual reality is, is a great tool for simulation of things that you cannot do safely. You know, the training applications are great examples of that. But if you can do it in real life, real life is much more interesting. Yeah. Great question. What would you do if you could get FDA approval? For this one. <laughs> this one's already FDA approved, but not for, for VR, right? Um, but but that's, that's, a, that's a really wonderful question. I think what I would really love to do on this sort of you know, crazy trajectory of, of you could deploy it on, on folks is to actually try out how would our experiences with learning physical skills change if someone had this at, like, you know, at school. If you could learn, as you were pointing out, with tangible and physical ways at school. If I was doing muscle plotter, I didn't show you, but there's an application of muscle plotter where people are actually typing polynomial equations and it just shows you the equation. But now you're feeling this equation, not just watching it on the computer screen on mathematical overall from alpha. Like, what does it mean to feel these things? And I would love to do a field study where I just deploy this on a classroom and like interview the kids and try to figure out if we might be in a sort of local maxima where we think computers helped us tremendously to learn new things, but there is even a bigger maxima over here if we continue and try to bring back some of the physicality that we lost by over relying on the visuals. They're great, but I'm not sure if they are the only, the only way to learn. There's a lot of people that need to learn physically with physical metaphors and physical analogies. That's what I would love to do. I don't know if it's implanted or something crazy just to, 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 provoke, to go to your provocation, but, but I would love to try that. Yeah. Last call. I think there's one just behind you. Um, I guess I'm curious uh, about maybe like long-term consequences of this type of youth level. You know, it's so very uh, yeah. important today. That um, if, if you're stimulating the body, even if it's like advanced training that you can naturally produce it later on, if that produces any type of wear either on the brain or muscles, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because it's faster than what we can naturally produce. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so I actually don't know the answer, but yes, that's a really good question. So. The, the sort of like wear on the muscles and all that, this has been used for so long, the muscle stimulation, I'm now pointing at the transcranial, this is more recent, but since the 90s. Um, the other one since the 60s. Then we know very much that there is no downside to the muscle side. Okay, you could get into a situation where just like how can you maybe hurt yourself by going to the gym and doing too, rep too repetitive strain movements, that can happen too. But you asked even a subsequent question which is more interesting. If you do the kind of accelerated reaction times, what happens in the long run? And that I agree with you that uh, I don't know the answer because it's somewhat literally. Um, our feeling is that that even promotes the fact that we shouldn't do too much acceleration. We should do these inching increments like what we're doing when we're delaying to make it closer to your natural resonance somehow and to sort of help you guide the way. Um, so I would definitely suggest not doing the extreme and sort of doing the one that is closer to the person. I think if people are reporting agency, that's actually a positive signal for us, and we should respect that somehow and say, then let's go that way rather than the extreme way. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Well, let's Thank you. Thank you.